so transitional fossils for anybody who's watching who still thinks that there's no transitional fossils what are some examples of those you can just name them up and i'll show them i'm going to show the visual as you're saying them. yeah and I, remind me to send you a, an excellent visual uh Absolutely. i compiled it myself for at least the hominins but uh, yeah so so for humans which i I'm biased because I study hominins and I study, well, I study extant primates, but I'm currently in line to be a PhD to study hominins too. Uh, and we we can, who, oh, also, you just want me to list some? I can just list them yeah, all. Yeah, list them and I'll just show them over as yeah. you're Oh yeah, so we have Sahelanthropus chidensis living 7 million years ago. This is our first hominin who's starting to show bipedal adaptations. After Sahelanthropus, we have Aurorin tugenensis, who also has bipedal adaptations specifically in the head of the femur. We have Ardipithecus ramidus and Ardipithecus cadaba. These guys are very interesting because just like modern humans and unlike many other primates, they're monomorphic. So males and females have the same size canine teeth and they're also the same size as one another. They also have many bipedal adaptations, including a very human looking hip with partially sagittally oriented iliac blades, a ventral or underneath foramen magnum, and two out of three arches in their feet, just like modern humans have. After Ardipithecus ramidus to the side, you've got Kenianthropus platyops, who's a very, very weird hominin, and we are not sure where it fits. It's got a super flat orthognathic face, uh, littler teeth. We don't really know what Kenianthropus is doing, but hopefully we'll find out someday. Then we have the Australopithecines. Oh, we've got a lot of Australopithecines. We have Australopithecus anamensis, Australopithecus afarensis, Australopithecus africanus, Australopithecus gari, Australopithecus sediba, and depending on who you talk to, you might get Australopithecus baral ghazali in there too. I tend to be like, uh, you know, might, you might be better off lumping that one. Um, to the side, we have cousins who aren't directly on our lineage, but are hominins nonetheless. They're definitive bipeds. They've got bigger brains than modern chimps by almost two times, but they are definitely separate from us. They branched off earlier from Australopithecines. These would be paranthropines, so Paranthropus boisei, Paranthropus robustus, and Paranthropus apiopicus. Continuing on from the Australopithecines, you have the emergence of genus Homo with Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, these are the first guys, still smallish brains, but using tools, making cut marks, etc. Uh, depending on who you talk to, Homo georgicus and Homo ergaster, both preceding Homo erectus. Then you've got Homo erectus. This is, this is the world beater. This is the one to beat. Homo erectus lived on the planet nine times longer than we've been here so far. They were absolute, incredible globetrotters. They went everywhere. Once they reach the north, uh, up in, in northern Europe, you see the emergence of from Homo erectus, or rather, I guess you would say, I guess you would say it depends on who you talk to, but either from Homo erectus or Homo hadobergensis, who comes next in Africa, you get the, um, the emergence of, in different parts of the world, Homo neanderthalensis in northern Europe or Eurasia, Denisovans, or depending on where this goes, Homo longi over in Asia, on the island of Flores, you have a three foot tall hominin, literally the size of a hobbit from Lord of the Rings, right? With big feet, just like a hobbit and a little bitty pinhead known as Homo floresiensis. And then on an, and on an adjacent island, a similarly small hobbit who is morphologically distinct called Homo luzonensis. Back down in the south, in South Africa, all by itself, just mulling around, we have a uh, Homo naledi who's weirdly basal. This thing had the lower body that was essentially just very modern human, very indistinguishable from modern humans. And while her top, her, because this, this, most of the specimens we've seen so far, some of the specimens we've seen so far are female, uh, but from its upper body, you would be like, this looks really familiar, but it's really in the uncanny valley because its face was still pretty apish and it had a pretty small brain case for something that is considered in the homo genus. Now it's, it's a world beater compared to the Australopithecines, but the brain's still kind of pinheaded. Arms are weird though. They're very long and they're very apish, suggesting that for whatever reason, Homo naledi comes from an Australopithecine that started to advance into genus Homo and then basically was like, nah, we're good. We'll, we'll readapt a little bit to the trees. Um, and it probably has something to do with the fact that it's living in South Africa, isolated from any other hominin. There's no exchange of information going on. So left to its own devices, the pressure disappeared to select for this cognition, um, at least for whatever reason in, in Homo naledi. And then from Homo heidelbergensis, we see the emergence of archaic Homo sapiens and eventually anatomically modern Homo sapiens, who's living at the same time of many of these hominins, which is just crazy to think about. And through all of these, we can track the emergence of bipedality, so the emergence of, of standing up on two feet. This is early, early stuff. Um, we see the rise of tool use. 
And we see the explosion of the brain case size. We see the teeth begin to shrink. We see the face begin to flatten. You know, we humans, we have a muzzle, but it's very small. Like our faces are comparatively very flat to, to other apes. The hands become more dexterous, the wrists more mobile. Um, and of course, all of our adaptations for, for these big brains tend to manifest themselves in, in our tool use, right? So we see the, the material culture evolve along with the hominins. So we have a lot of transitional species for human evolution. And that's just starting at the apes. We could name many, many more if we included the evolution of monkeys to apes or uh, omomides and adapteds into lemurs and monkeys respectively. I mean, you could take it back to the last universal common ancestor if you freaking wanted to. <laughs> or even if you get into other animals, how much yep. you can see those evolve too. It's like, you can't Certainly. escape this. This evolution thing is pretty much a fact. Oh yeah, you, you see it in cetaceans. You can, I mean, you can track at least half a dozen, if not quite a bit more of the evolution from land dwelling um, uh, artiodactyls or like even toed ungulates into what would become these whales and dolphins. And curiously, they're characterized, all cetaceans today have this weird little inner ear structure called an involucrum, right? And this involucrum is found in every cetacean today and in a select few transitional species that are starting to become more aquatic. And then it's found in a little hoofed artiodactyl called Indohyus that lived um, in the Eocene, I think. Um, and Indohyus's knees, or sorry, ankles, which have this, this structure called an astragalus, right? The astragalus is maintained in all of these precedingly aquatic species all the way into Basilosaurus, which is a fully aquatic, almost megalodon-sized whale. Why does it have the ankles of a hoofed land mammal? Wow. It doesn't make any sense, in, except in the light of evolution, right? Yeah. And, you, and you could, like you said, you could do this for anything. You could do this with the tetrapods. You could do this with the evolution of birds from theropod dinosaurs, right? Uh, and, and, oh, isn't sorry. There, isn't there an animal that has uh, horns that go into its head and kill itself? Oh yeah, yeah, rams, that happens with rams. It'll happen with rodents. If rodents don't actually continuously chew, their incisors are ever growing. So if their incisors, you know, become chipped or misaligned at all, then they'll just grow and penetrate the skull. Tusks will do this and things like um, like suids, so warthogs and, and pigs. Uh, and I think teya suids too. So like peccaries, it's, it's nightmarish. You really don't, I mean, we're really lucky with the, the situation that we're in. Yeah. Nothing in us grows and then kills us, which is nuts. Which is like, I mean, it's pretty obvious that there's nothing creating this stuff. This is processes and it's not, there's not a mind behind it that's like controlling it. It's could go bad, basically, is what I'm saying. It's aggressively uh, Rube Goldberg and it is aggressively imperfect. Yeah. Um, now, you might could take the stance that if you want to, if you want to take a real vague deism, you might be able to say, Whoever started all this, they put evolution into place. And evolution is perfect in one thing, maintaining life. And if that's all the, de the deity wants to do is maintain life, then they've done a bang up job with evolution. Yeah. Uh, but evolution doesn't care about the individual. It cares no. about the persistence of the gene and of the species. That's what I was going to say is like, if you don't, the only deist position that I would entertain and, and, and that I, I can't think of anyone who can debunk is, um, is that deism right the, the big bang happened and it's a basically program to start life off and create the earth and that's it though but not not caring about anything inside of it like not really focusing on what humans do or what we believe in or if we worship it or not like none of that matters it's just boom i started this universe now i'm going on and do another one i don't even care yeah. that's it that's all you can really say and and honestly like i this is why, you know, as the stalwart agnostic, I maintain that it's a very honest position to hold because you're basically saying, yeah, I guess that could be. I can't prove you wrong on that. But I also don't seek to try to. Like, I, this is why I love science so much, because science seeks to to work in the empirical. It Once you get into metaphysics, science is like, that's not my zone, man. Like, we're, we're trying to understand the world so that we can make predictions that make the lives of us and of the other denizens of the planet better. Once you're like, who started the Big Bang or what potentially tinkered with the, the conditions so that life on Earth would, would be possible, I don't know. And I don't really care. You know, we're, we're here, right? That, right. That's, if you really want to go with, with 
you know, using bad language, that's a bit miraculous, isn't it? It's crazy that we're here at all, yeah. uh, but incredible. It is. <laughs> Why is there nothing? Why is there something rather than nothing? It's just. Yeah, I mean, it, it's like, it, it, a headache when I think about it. it really you does. you can, and there's been some interesting work done by um, oh Jeremy England. He's a, a biochemist, or no, he's a physicist. He's a physics guy, but he touched on biochemistry, and he actually makes the argument that DNA aids in increasing the entropy of the universe ultimately. So, so the emergence of life increases chaos overall. So it would be naturally selected for at a at a cosmic scale because the universe wants quote unquote, to become more disordered. So life then would be inevitable almost uh, if the conditions are right, because if it makes things more chaotic, physics will quote unquote, select for it, um, which is crazy. That's wild. You know what? I just, I thought about this and we're gonna, we, can, we can end on this because I'm keeping you so long, but this oh, ending, so. has been amazing. I can, I, I'll wax po listen, I, I warned you about the monologue and you, at the beginning you were like, oh, I don't know, things might get stale. I don't know that we'll be able to make it in an hour. I was like, we'll be able to make it in an hour. I, know, I knew he would. I was just, you know, putting it out there just in case. Yeah. Um, this is awesome. I can keep going for this. This is just awesome. But I almost wonder like if, if not humans, but evolution in general, like life on earth is the, the end goal. Like, I guess Nietzsche would call this the Superman or, or whatever, but this, that's philosophy and this is science. But the, what if, what if, this is just a what if random question that no, you're not going to have the answer to this, neither am I. But what if like, it's all meant to make like artificial intelligence so that the artificial intelligence can leave the womb of earth and go into space and do bigger things that we can't even imagine right now. And like, you would think someone would say artificial intelligence isn't natural, but like, when you when you zoom out and look at it from a macro perspective, how is it how is it not? If it's coming out of the earth, everything in the earth is what it is. What if that's the whole entire thing, the whole point? If we're just a rope to the Superman, like Nietzsche would say. I I will say one thing that's always I've always found this very fascinating, and I'm not uh, certainly not the first person to do so, but it sure is interesting that the the incredibly microscopic and the incredibly macroscopic look very similar. It's very weird. It is weird. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know why that is. Um, yeah. But I mean, who knows? I mean, the, the, there's there's a lot of but depending on how you use the word selection. I mean, you you almost end up accidentally selecting for these these if England is right, these complex and eventually chaotic and entropic um, dynamic systems that we call life. Um, so I don't know. It's it's fun to talk about. It is.